We're only 48 hours away from the first round of the 2023 NFL Draft. What are things looking like on the number five pick front for the Seahawks? And who are John Schneider and Pete Carroll going to select? We're going to be dishing out our final big boards for the first pick here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined for our Tuesday episode by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening from Las Vegas you're listening, please greatly and every one of you making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We've got a jam-packed Tuesday episode two days before the 2023 NFL draft commences. We're going to be looking at some potential pairs of teammates that could be draft picks for the Seahawks, which would stick with a historical trend for John Schneider and Pete Carroll. And we'll be checking out this year's crop of safeties in the 2023 draft class First round grades, second day grades, and third day grades. A lot of information coming your way as we draw much closer here to the real deal, the real NFL draft coming up. Now for your lead story here on our Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. We've got just a little over 48 hours until the Seahawks will be on the clock making their top five selection, or will they? At this point, the only certainty that we have is we don't have any certainty about what the Seahawks are going to be doing with their first selection. They could pick a player at number five, such so as Jalen Carter. They might trade down. Maybe they fool everybody and trade up. At this point, the only people that have an idea what's going to happen are in the draft room. And even those in the draft room might not necessarily know what is going to be transpiring here in a couple of days. And so with that being said, Rob, We have had so much time the last couple of months to dissect all the different players that could be possibilities for the Seahawks at number five. It is time for us to dish out our final big boards at number five. And just as some clarification, this does not mean these are the 10 best players in our opinion. They are the 10 best fits for the Seahawks based on their needs at pick number five. And so I'm going to give you the mic here to kick things off. How does your list look in terms of best fits for the Seahawks heading into Thursday night? Yeah, and thanks, Corbin. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, I, I, you mentioned the fact that this is different than our own personal big board, and, and that's a big deal for me because I, I have a personal big board, and that has, I think, likely to be Carolina Panthers number one overall pick and current Alabama quarterback Bryce Young number one overall for the league. But for the Seahawks specifically. I have the number one prospect in this draft and the player who I think is the likeliest to be the number one player on their board is the Georgia defensive tackle, Jalen Carter. We've talked so much about Jalen Carter throughout this entire process. Corbin, to me, if he is on your board at all, then he's number one overall. And, and that's the, that's the conversation here is you have to have that conversation about whether or not that Jalen Carter is on your board. Obviously there are some, uh, you know, different things that, that, that people have to talk about, but when you watch this guy, they're, they're, they're so Corbin, I've been doing this for a long, long time. And one of my very favorite terms and descriptions to use is to ragdoll somebody, but we very rarely actually see somebody who has that type of physical power to just toss 300 pound men. And that's exactly what Jalen Carter has to me. He is the, the best player in this draft class. He is the biggest literally and figuratively reason why the Georgia Bulldogs won the two last two national championships in college football. And if he is available to the Seahawks at number five overall, I, I think that they're, it is going to be some kind of conversations inside, inside the inside the, the you know Seattle's front office about what they want to do inside Seattle's coaching staff about what they want to do. But I, I think that if you're looking for a guy who can make an immediate impact, if you really believe that Geno Smith is the answer at quarterback and you are ready to win right now, then I think se- selecting a player like Jalen Carter can take Seattle's defense, which was an eyesore. Let's be real. 30th in the NFL and run defense a year ago. And I think that it immediately transforms that defense and, and puts Seattle in a, in a case where they are going to be one of the more intriguing teams in all of the NFC. That's why Jalen Carter ranks top on my board. 
Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. Looking at my board, I've got Jalen Carter at number one, too, because I have been waffling on this. I have been seesawing back and forth. Those who listen to our show, we've had some mock drafts we've run where I've picked other players because I was presuming that Jalen Carter was not on Seattle's board. There's been some reports out there that he may not be on their board at this point, or he's not going to be the pick. I would just caution anybody to think that those reports are full truth. It is two days before the NFL draft. And so you have got to be keeping your guard. I don't think that at this point that we should rule out the possibility that Jalen Carter could still be going to the Seattle Seahawks just because of the fact this kid could be a potential generational talent at defensive tackle, the biggest need on Seattle's roster. You know Seattle is still torn over this, or maybe they have made their decision, but it does feel like this is one of those cases that they're going to have to wait up until they see where they're at at number five. And if he's the best player there, I still think there's a chance they're going to take him. Will Anderson, I don't know if he makes it number five, but there's still an outside shot that he could be there at number five. I've got him at number two on my board. And then I've got Tyree Wilson at number three. I know that he is not the popular trendy pick anymore for Seahawk fans, but there have been some murmurs out there. You can thank Richard Sherman and Quandre Diggs on Sherman's podcast for bringing this up. There are murmurs. They might go back to the defense they ran before last year. And if they are going to be running more even fronts, Tyree Wilson would make even more sense for the Seahawks as a base defensive end. And so that is something to keep an eye on. If they choose him, that might be a hint that we are going back to what we did before last year and we're going to buck this experiment that we did in 2022. So those would be my first three players and you would be in agreement. We're in agreement on that. We both have Anthony Richardson at number four most intriguing quarterback with the traits that he has that has the best chance to be there for the Seahawks at pick number five. Where we start to split up, though, is with looking at players we think are worthy at number five. You've got another quarterback on your list. I've got a cornerback on the defensive side of the football in Devin Witherspoon just because I think the Seahawks are legitimately interested in him with everything that we've seen to this point, and he is such a good fit from a physicality standpoint. Oh, he is. I mean, yeah, Witherspoon's a really good football player, so you're not going to hear me criticize uh, you know, that conversation. But at the same time, I want to briefly go back to the idea of Will Anderson and Tyree Wilson. The Seahawks fans are just like kind of bored with the idea of Tyree Wilson. I want to slap a couple of people upside the head because, my goodness, you're talking about a, a guy of his size and his athletic ability. Corbin, I don't care what scheme you run, what position you put him at. He is a top five defensive prospect in this draft class and and so again if if that is Seattle's primary uh concern then I think that he is somebody that you have to consider as it is again Will Anderson and this is again presuming that Bryce Young is off the board is it presuming that CJ Stroud is off the board the most accurate quarterback in this draft class I don't care what he scored on the S2 test I I like what he did (laughs) against the University of Georgia what he did over his entire college career he needs some time but still very, very talented quarterback. So again, presuming those guys are off the board. But going back to uh, Will Levis and my number five candidate in this class, I, I do for Seattle. I, I do think that a defensive lineman makes a little bit more sense. But again, we, we've had this conversation before about Anthony Richardson and and Will Levis as well. A, a quarterback at number five overall makes some sense because you have this unique opportunity as. I can't remember if it was Pete Carroll or John Schneider, but let's, you know, they're a marriage. You know, they, they, they you know, they, they, they share sentiments in these kind of things. And so their idea is the same. This is a very unique opportunity. And whether it be Will Levis or Anthony Richardson, you're, you're talking about quarterbacks who just have such incredible talent. I mean, you got to trust John Schneider and his scouts and what they are seeing on, you know, in their travels throughout the, the season. If they believe that this guy is the guy to move forward with, then of course you make that selection. So I think with Will Levis, the, the, the pro readiness, uh, of, of playing the last couple of years in the NFL system, the, the really quick release, the really strong arm, the really good toughness, the really good intangibles as far as a leader. If Will Levis is not successful in the NFL, it will not be because he is a one at bad enough. And that's the number one thing that you want to check off. If you have questions about Jalen Carter, then you don't have those same questions about Will Levis. That's a completely different conversation. So to me, that's why we have to have this conversation. Is, is John Schneider talks so much, and Pete Carroll obviously compete, compete, compete. It, it's all about competition. 
if you are going to go in a different direction here, never, rather than defensive line, which I think is Seattle's biggest area of concern, if you are going to go with the quarterback, then he has to check all of those other boxes. Will Levis is going to check a lot of those boxes. I, I'm fascinated to see where he winds up going. It could be that if he's available to Seattle number five, they feel like they have to take him. I personally have him drop him down a little bit farther to the Houston Texans, but they got number two and number 12. So they got an awful lot of flexibility there. But Will Levis definitely has a physical trace to be a star quarterback in the NFL. And that's why I think that he has to be in play for Seattle number five. Yeah, we're in agreement for the most part. You and I have the same first four players as contenders for that number five pick. And then the only discrepancy, Witherspoon versus Levis, as far as players we think are worth that number five pick. I don't even have Levis on my list for guys for trading down in our top 10. Christian Gonzalez, Miles Murphy, Peter Skronsky, players like that. You could make arguments for all of them. Maybe Levis is another tier or two down there, but that's just personal preference for me as far as scouting goes. And I just feel like there is a significant gap between Richardson and Levis, what they're going to be bringing to the NFL. But the point is, there's still a very limited number of guys here that Seattle's going to be looking at five. Otherwise, I do think that John Schneider's going to be looking to trade down and hope to get one of those players in that second grouping and recoup another pick, hopefully on day two, to take advantage of a class that has plenty of depth. Coming up next, the Seahawks over the years have had no issue drafting teammates. In fact, they've done it almost 50% of the time. Under Pete Carroll and John Schneider, we're going to be looking back at those, and we're going to be picking our five favorite pairs of draft prospects this year that we'd like to see come to Seattle and stay as teammates with the Seahawks. We'll get to that here in a moment on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. The NBA playoffs are officially here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and three-pointers drained. I'm a huge fan of player prop parlays, and you can make bets such as Michael Porter Jr. scoring 20 points at plus 120, plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbett Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, as always, for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. For our everydayers, make sure to tune in tomorrow, the day before the draft. We're going to be dishing out our final mock drafts, and Rob and I are going to have a chance to really skewer each other there with our critiques on each other's final drafts, the ones that we know are going to happen on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Really looking forward to that. And make sure to check out the new Locked On NFL Draft newsletter here at Locked On. Luke Inman has done a remarkable job putting that together. You can check out that free resource before Thursday's draft at LockedOnPodcast.com slash newsletters to sign up for your free NFL Draft newsletter. All right, Rob, we are getting closer and closer to the 2023 NFL Draft, 48 hours away from the festivities kicking off in Kansas City. We've talked a lot on this show about different trends over the years for John Schneider and Pete Carroll, but there's one that I don't believe we have ever talked about, and I don't know necessarily that it's one that has a ton of value, but it's certainly interesting, and that is drafting teammates from the same college in the same draft. And John Schneider and Pete Carroll have not been strangers to keeping teammates together in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, they have done it six times in 13 previous drafts. So this is not something that only occasionally happens. We're talking almost 50% of the time. In 2020, Damian Lewis, Stephon Sullivan from LSU. 2019, Marquise Blair and Cody Barton both coming from Utah as day two selections. 2017, Lano Hill and Amara Darbo from Michigan. 2015, late rounders from Oregon State, Abun Guachum and Ryan Murphy. 2013, LSU. Seattle loves picking LSU players. Theral Simon and Spencer Ware that year. And then 2012, this is maybe the one that shocks me the most. Utah State of all programs, two in the same year. A future Hall of Famer and Bobby Wagner being one of them, a really solid reserve back in Robert Turpin. So when we're talking Emerald City duos, the Seahawks have had a number of pairs come from college as teammates and stay teammates in the NFL. And that led us to think about 
what pairs would we like to see in Seahawks uniform from the same college in this year's draft class? And we had some of the same ones, so we had to fight and debate, play a little bit of Super Smash Bros to try to figure out who was going to get to pick what. But let's talk our (laughs) top five pairings that we would like to see in Seattle. And Rob, I know there is a particular prospect that we've talked about a ton. We talked about him in the first quarter, too. He's been in the news for good and bad reasons, but his school, Georgia's won the last two national championships. So, of course, you'd like to see two of their players in Seattle. Two? Uh, I'd like to see a lot uh, of the Georgia Bulldogs. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. They, they, they've won a lot, you know, back-to-back national championships. And again, Jalen Carter as a defensive tackle position, Tacoma Zone, Keely Ringo. I mean, I, if we're going to go with a cornerback, why not go with a guy who has the best combination of size and speed in the draft? Uh, you know, and, and the running back, Kenny McIntosh, the quarterback, Stetson Bennett. There's so many good players uh, in Georgia, uh, you know, that I think that you have to start the conversation with the two-time defending national champions those of you who are on youtube and thank you all as corbin said earlier thank you all for those of you who are watching on youtube those of you listening i'm just going to rattle off these names real quick and and corbin i i love the fact that we're having this conversation because as you said the seahawks have done this many times and the fact that this year's class i think has a lot of really cool teammates that make make some sense for the Seahawks. So Jalen Carter, Nolan Smith are among the Georgia Bulldogs. Again, I'm excited about Keely Ringo, as I mentioned, Setson Bennett, Kenny McIntosh, among the others. You got to go to the Ohio State Buckeyes, you know, the team that Georgia beat the national championship game. CJ Stroud, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Luke Whipler, the center, uh, Zach Harrison, the edge rusher, uh, a lot of really good football players um, for the Buckeyes. I'm going to mention a team that not a lot of people are probably going to think about, and that's going to be the UCLA Bruins. And, and I want to mention the running back, Zach Charbonnet, who I think the Seattle is, is a really interesting selection for the Seahawks in the second round, um, whether it be number 37 or number 53. I think the Charbonnet is going to go right around there, and I think that he just checks a lot of boxes. And then the guard, John Gaines. The quarterback, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, um, you know, really talented player. Uh, Dallas mentioned him yesterday. I think that he had him in our, in our actual draft. And I think that there's a possibility for DTR. Um, so again, UCLA is another program that, that I'm really excited about. But as you said, Corbin, we were throwing things at each other because there were so many teams that we both liked some of the players, some of the teammates and thought that they might be natural Seahawks. So who's some of the players, who's some of the programs that you were excited to talk about? Yeah, I will admit, Georgia, that was the one that we had to fight over because, as you mentioned, there's like 30 guys that have draftable grades from that program. So you could make an argument we both can get pairs of teammates. Maybe Seattle drafts five Bulldogs in this draft. Who knows? And Ohio State has the same type of depth. But if we're looking at big programs, of course we've got to include the Alabama Crimson Tide in here. They've got at least seven or eight guys that are going to hear their names called during this draft process. And Will Anderson Jr. is the one that is the pipe dream. The Seahawks are hoping he falls to number five. So they have a chance to get a guy that had 17 and a half sacks in one season in the SEC two years ago, over 50 tackles for a loss, an unanimous All-American the last two years. But there's other guys that would make a lot of sense from Alabama as well. And for me, I actually have Byron Young, the defensive tackle, as the pairing that I would like to see in Seattle in the middle rounds because I think he'd be a really nice fitness 3-4 defense playing that 3-tech 4 I position, a guy that's physical, not the greatest athlete, but he plays such smart, savvy football. And physically, he's an imposing dude. So those two players, if you wanted to go Brian Branch, that would be another guy that would be interesting because of his slot versatility, but not necessarily a need for the Seahawks. But Alabama's got a ton of guys. Jameer Gibbs is another player that I could put on there. And how about the Florida Gators? Anthony Richardson and Osiris Torrance in your first couple of rounds. You get your future franchise quarterback. You get a guy that I think would start a right guard on day one for the Seahawks and Osiris Torrance. Those two would make a lot of sense. There's some other good Florida players in this draft, but those would be the two that jump out to me as the best fits of the Seahawks, and you would be drafting them in the early rounds. And I would be remiss not to mention the Illinois Fighting Illini, who I think have at least three secondary players that will be gone by the end of the third round. Devin Witherspoon's going to be gone in the first five picks, at least in my opinion. I think he's going to be gone in those first five picks, maybe as early as Arizona at number three. 
And then you've got Sidney Brown, who I'm sure we'll be talking about more later in the show. One of my favorite safeties in this class, a guy that's played a lot of games in the Big Ten. And then you got Quan Martin, another player that's played safety and corner that could go as early as the late second round. And he's been a ball hawk. So that is a team where you could just look at a position grouping and say, hey, we're going to pick two of you guys to bring to Seattle together and you get to play in our secondary. And they've got some other good players like Chase Brown, the brother of Sidney Brown, who could be a running back option for the Seahawks. As far as a couple others that jumped out to me, Rob, Iowa is another one you and I both had on our short list. I ended up winning that battle for Lucas Van Ness and Jack Campbell, but you could also throw Sam Laporta on this list. One of my favorite tight ends from this class and a guy that is an after the catch maestro, which Seattle needs any guys they can that can create after the catch. He's one of the best tight ends in college football at doing that. He's a solid blocker as well. And my last one, this is not one you would think of normally. Tulane is not a football powerhouse, but Tajay Spears and Dorian Williams, I think, would both be excellent fits for the Seattle Seahawks. And picks and getting both of those guys in Seattle, I think that they could be guys that could fit in culture-wise as long-term foundational pieces on offense and defense. Yeah, it's it's a nice collection of players. I mean, it's a fun group. I mean, there's... I'm gonna kind of go switch back here for a moment. One of my favorite programs, actually two, Tennessee and Kansas State. Uh, you know, Tennessee again. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can see the graphics. Those of you who are not, uh, you know, the, the three other programs that I mentioned besides Georgia and Ohio State, Tennessee, Hendon Hooker, the wide receiver combination of Jalen Hyatt, Cedric Tillman. Uh, I, I think that they've got the the best offensive line as far as just the toughest, nastiest guy um, in, in their right tackle. Um, I and you know, to me, I look at the Tennessee Volunteers, the the linebacker, Jeremy Banks, is a player that I'm really interested in. Uh, I, I think that, that Seattle has to do kind of some investigating on him because I do think that an off-ball linebacker continues to be a position of concern for him, but he is not listed on there. Kansas State, again, Felix and Anadike Uzama. Julius, or some people call him Juju Brents, the cornerback we've talked so many times before. Um, definitely the the running back, Deuce Vaughn, we've talked about so many times before. To me, those are some of the programs that just make so much sense. I think that Seattle has to kind of be doing what they've done before. And that's kind of how we we let off the segment here, Corb. I mean, you know, three times here in the last five years that the Seahawks have kind of doubled down with teammates at the college level. And I think it just makes sense. The Seahawks, as I mentioned before in the first segment, um, there were only two teams in all of the NFL that had a worse run defense than the Seahawks a year ago. What what Seattle had a year last season with Geno Smith and the 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 two rookie of the year candidates that Seattle had was a pretty spectacular season. And so I, I think that what we have to see here is that if you were expecting them to take another jump, then they are going to have to have some rookies who are going to be able to come in and hit the ground running. The same thing that we saw last year. One of the ways of doing that is having guys who already have some camaraderie, already have some rapport. So that's the strategy I think that Seattle is going to again follow. And that's why I love the fact that we're talking about this here just a couple of days before the draft. I'm going to throw one more group in here real quick before we move into talking safeties. Wisconsin doesn't have quite as much talent in this draft as what they have had in other years, but Keanu Benton and Joe Tipman on day two, if you could get both of those players to shore up your trenches on offense and defense, those would be home run picks for the Seahawks as well. And so I feel like there are more pairings of teammates, at least that match up with Seattle's needs this year, that also would be realistic that you could get them at different parts of the draft, especially with 10 selections. And that makes it a lot of fun. It'll be interesting to see which teammate tandems that John Schneider and Pete Carroll decide to bring in this time around, because you got close to a 50% chance of it happening based on past precedent we're going to be talking the safety class coming up next our three tiers the first rounders day two selections and of course the day three gems we're going to get to those players coming up next year on our tuesday edition of locked on seahawks now for a word from our sponsor better health life can be full of twists and turns and throw a few wrenches at you when you least expect it so it's important to show yourself through it all better help online therapy will affect your needs and can match you with your own Licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. Therapy worked wonders for me, but don't just take my word for it. Having someone in your corner to guide you when you're struggling to navigate obstacles can be invaluable. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online, available to people worldwide. With therapy, it can take a few tries to find the right fit for you. 
And BetterHelp is a great way to invest in yourself. BetterHelp has a special offer for our listeners. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash locked on. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com slash locked on. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbett Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, as always, for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Make sure to check out the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. It's here and bigger than ever. I had three picks in the first round. A lot of fans not so happy with the selections that I made, but you can check those out and follow along all 32 First pick in a six episode all mint mock draft experience only locked on can deliver all episodes are available now on locked on nfl draft on youtube or wherever you listen to your podcast all right rob let's talk safeties we're getting towards the end of the line here we've talked hundreds of prospects on this podcast to this point this is not a great safety group i think that most people would agree with that sentiment there's not a lot of depth not a lot of elite talent But there is one player in particular that I think has a very good chance to hear his name called on day one, that being Brian Branch from Alabama. Yeah, to me, he's head and shoulders uh, easily the the best safety in this draft class. Some view him as a possible cornerback, uh, and I understand that. He's 6'1", 190 pounds. Uh, You know, not, not a lot of safeties in the NFL that are 190 pounds. I think that regardless of where you line at Brian Branch, he is going to be successful in the NFL. That's why you said, Corbin, he's going to be a first-round pick. He is the only one of you as a first-round pick if there was somebody who might surprise people. I think Antonio Johnson from Texas A&M, to me, it, it's funny. Uh, I actually kind of compare him to a former Seahawk, Marquise Blair, um, in that he is a kind of a long, lanky guy. He's 6'2", he's 200 pounds. But he hits like an absolute train wreck. I mean, this guy comes down and fills the alley, and and teams get excited about that. And as you said, and I think accurately, this is not a great safety class. But teams that need a safety are still going to take a safety. I I hope think that from a Seahawks perspective that they are not going to go safety too early unless. They are planning on making some other type of of move uh, at that position. Um, To me, Antonio Johnson is one of those guys who has the physical upside that you're looking for. You just want to make sure that he's going to be able to be just as effective in coverage as he is coming downhill. Um, And so in my opinion, there's some other players we're going to talk about a little bit later that will have a very similar skill set. But if there is a player who is going to join Branch as a top, you know, 40, top 50 player, it's Texas A&M's Antonio Johnson. And see, that's where you and I, it's going to be interesting on this show, because I think on a lot of position groups, you and I have had fairly similar rankings. I think going into this show that has become apparent that you and I have some different viewpoints at safety. And I'm excited to talk about it because I actually have Johnson as my eighth best safety in this class. I'm really scared by his coverage stuff. And maybe he develops that in the NFL. There's a lot to like about him. The hard hitting If you're looking for an enforcer near the box, then he can check that box off. I'm just not investing a first or even a second round pick in a player like that. Brian Branch, his ability to play in the slot, blitz and get sacks, blow people up in the run game, play both safety spots. To me, he is head and shoulders above everybody else in this class. And that's why I would be stunned if he's not one of the first 31 picks in this draft in the first round. Another player that I think has a chance to rocket up draft boards and maybe go a lot earlier than people think. We've talked a lot about Chase Brown from Illinois. Let's talk about his brother, Sidney Brown, who brings good size to the table. If you look at some pictures of this guy, he is yoked. This guy, He looks like an NFL safety that can get in the box and hit people. You can see it in the game film for the number one scoring defense, the fighting Illini. This guy would come up and just wreck people. Maybe not a Cam Chancellor type, but he's going to come up and make hits. He's a sound tackler, and he had six interceptions last year for Illinois. So he's got really good ball skills, great route recognition, had some issues with tight ends at times last year, but I think he's got the size and athleticism to be able to clean that up in the NFL. He is actually my number two safety at this point because I had some concerns and then he went to the combine and put together an outstanding workout. The athleticism is the only thing that I had some reservations about, but I love the football player. To me, he's a slam dunk on day two as a second round pick. 
Wow, it's a second round pick. Yeah, I hey, I I like Chase Brown, I like Sydney Brown. I, I like the the Brown family. I mean, they are uh, they are terrific football players. Uh, I'm going to mention the quote unquote other Illinois player, and, and that's Rotavius Martin. Some people call him Quan. Um, again, another guy who's a little bit undersized, 5'11", 194 pounds. And so, as you mentioned before, with Brown, a, a bigger safety, and I certainly like that. I like the fact that Brown was a four-year starter. Martin was a four-year player as well. And I like Martin's versatility a little bit more. Um, I like the fact that he he slot he slid inside to play uh, a, a lot of nickel. Um, he had played previously at corner. He had played the deep safety. Just a terrific athlete, as you mentioned with Brown. He is as well. Um, that Illinois secondary is absolutely fantastic. And uh, you know, so to me. Quan Martin is a guy on day two. I expect to go some. I expect him to go somewhere in that range, just because of the athletic ability um, and, and the fact that he, he does have some ball skills. He does have some fluidity to him. So to me, he is one of the guys that that makes an awful lot of sense on day two uh, of the safeties. Um, you know, some of the other players. I I, I got to mention a guy that I'm not going to really get a chance to talk about in in the last couple of moments here. So I'm going to mention him now, and that's Marte Mapu, real quick, from Sacramento State. This is a big guy um, at 6'3", 220 pounds. So I want to definitely make sure that I mention him now um, just because he's a guy that, uh, I, again, I, I believe that some clubs are excited about and that not a lot of people have been talking about here. But, again, somebody who I think is likely to go in day three but has a chance, I'm literally getting texts about him at this moment, um, has a chance to be a top 100 selection. Yeah, he's the guy that Jim Nagy, our buddy, Senior Bowl director, has been pitching him on social media, I feel like, daily as a possibility. And he's been recovering from an injury, so maybe he's become a little bit of a okay. forgotten guy after doing some impressive things early in the Senior Bowl. He's coming from an FCS school, one that isn't known for kicking out players. This is not North Dakota State that seems to have multiple guys picked every year. This is Sacramento State, not known as a FCS powerhouse, but certainly he is an intriguing player that – Maybe he's a bit of a tweener, but I could see him playing safety because of his athleticism and his hard hitting. Speaking of hard hitting and being a forgotten man, I'd be remiss not to mention J.L. Skinner. And I've actually seen a few of these big draft outlets mentioning him as a day three selection, and maybe he falls to that point. But if that happens, whoever gets him on day three is getting a steal because we're talking about one of those rare six foot four 210 plus pound safeties that can cover he can pick off passes he can come up and deck people at the line of scrimmage you can blitz him there are some issues with his change of direction stuff which is why i was bummed we didn't get to see him test in indies recovering from a pectoral injury would have liked to see what he did to try to squash those concerns a little bit but Straight line speed is great. Positional flexibility is great. Again, has really good ball skills. Jail Skinner is my number three safety in this draft class, but I could see because of the fact he's coming off injury and didn't get to do any of the pre-draft workouts, I could see him slipping some. But again, whoever's going to pick that guy, you are getting a rare breed with a 6'4 safety that can come up and stick people and also has really good ball skills in Jail Skinner, a guy that I think has great day two value. Now let's get to our day three sleepers because, again, this is not – a deep class at safety. There's not a lot of talent in those first couple of rounds, but there are some day three sleepers. Rob, who's the first one that maybe isn't getting a lot of buzz, but could be a very good NFL safety at the next level? Well, I mentioned a moment ago, Mapu, who, uh, again, I, you're, you're such a pro, Corbin, in the way that you kind of, uh, you know, just spun off of the comment I was making about Mapu. And then you go into jail Skinner and even bigger guy at six, four, 211 pounds, Mapu 6'3, 217. Mapu is that cam chancellor downhill hit the alleyway, but you have some reservations and coverage Skinner. He has that great size, but he's actually very, very good in coverage. And so very different player. So again, just kind of a tip of the cap to you, sir. Again, Skinner is a really good player. Mapu is a guy who I'm excited about, but definitely is more raw. He wasn't invited to the combine, but he is among my favorite picks to be one of the first players that is selected this year that was not invited to the combine. And then to me, one of the players that I'm really excited about that I didn't get a chance to talk about before is Jamie Robinson from Florida State. Now, Corbin, to suggest that Jamie Robinson as a four-star recruit at South Carolina, starred there for two years, then transfers to Florida State, stars there for two years, four-year starter as a sleeper you know, in South Carolina and Florida State, then I, I can't make that 
claim. But he is a really good football player who, because he's slighter than, than people you know, want a safety to be at, at 5'11", 195 pounds, then he is not going to get much buzz. But damn it, he's a football player. I mean, this is a Seahawky kind of a guy. He's physical. He is instinctive. He is versatile. Um, you know, he's a guy that I really like a lot. 15 and a half tackles for loss over the last couple, excuse me. Uh, yeah, 15 and a half tackles for loss over the last couple of seasons. He's comfortable um, down in the hole. He's also comfortable on coverage, seven interceptions. Uh, and again, the level of competition in which you face in South Carolina, Florida State. To me, Jimmy Robinson is one of the players that I'm really, really high on. Uh, you mentioned Sidney Brown before as a player that I'm excited about as well. Mapu being another one. I don't love this safety class, but I do think that there are some players here who are pretty intriguing. You just got to kind of be able to jump in. And I think the safety just in general is a real interesting conversation for the Seahawks. You know, we've talked about this before that the Seahawks are, you know, kind of in a weird position. They only got 52 players on their roster. The two most expensive players on their team are both safeties. I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's some type of move made, uh, you know, and, and it allows the Seattle to, you know, perhaps get a little bit younger, a little bit cheaper at that position. So again, I think that um, it's, there's a reason why we're having this conversation about teammates, having this conversation about safeties just a couple of days before the draft. Yeah, a couple names that I quickly want to talk about, two different ends of the spectrum. You've got Brandon Joseph, who started his college career at Northwestern. And I just continue to be baffled why Northwestern has not been good the last couple of years when I see how many guys were either with their program and transferred or guys that were with their program last year and they haven't been able to win games, but they're going to be high draft picks. Brandon Joseph was going into this process looking like he was probably going to be a potential day two guy because you look at the production He's got as many interceptions as any of these safeties. This is a guy that's a ball hawk. He knows how to find the football. But when you watch the film, you don't see the speed. And then he goes to the combine and had a sub 30 inch vertical jump, did not run fast. I don't put too much stock in testing, but at the same time for a safety that is predicated on making interceptions, I don't care how instinctive you are. There comes a point where athletic limitations are going to hurt you in the NFL. And so I don't know what he projects to be in the league. I love what I see football skill wise on film from him, but I just have reservations about his athleticism. I can see a team on day three, though, striking gold if they can find a way to maximize his strengths and hide some of those athletic limitations. And I've got to mention, I've vented about this guy a few times. Every year, there's a couple guys that don't get invited to the combine and a lot of fans look at that as a death sentence. It's not. There are plenty of examples of guys that didn't go to the combine that became really good NFL players. I've talked about Carl Brooks, the Bowling Green defensive lineman. He's one of them. Javon Hicks, to me, though, yeah. might be the biggest omission that I've seen, especially with a safety class that you and I are both admitting is not good. So a good football player somehow not getting traction on several of the mock draft simulators, Javon Hicks from Cincinnati isn't even on the simulator as a top 500 player, and I don't get it. Double-digit interceptions in his career playing for a very good defense that had players like Kobe Bryant in the secondary, Sauce Gardner, tons of talent back there. He's so underappreciated, and yet the guy's a playmaker, and he ran a 4 6 He's not a burner. And yet he's one of those guys that plays faster on film. He comes up and sticks people. He can blitz. I have him as one of my early candidates as a day three selection. If I was a general manager, he would be high on my big board at this position group. I love the film that I've seen from this guy. And yet you want to talk about under the radar. He isn't even under the radar. He's completely off of it. And I just don't get it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think that if you are a proven playmaker at that level of competition, then then you should be definitely more on the radar than he is. But uh, again, I, I mentioned the, the players that, that I'm really in, intrigued by. I think that this is a weak safety class. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I would not be surprised at all if Seattle decided to use maybe a day two pick at the position. If Brian Branch falls all the way at 20, if Seattle does have plans 
with Jamal Adams, as some have speculated, then Brian Branch at 20 suddenly becomes a very interesting possibility. I don't know that that's going to be the case, um, but I do think that there is something going on there. Pete Carroll's comments when he was asked about linebackers during the pre-draft press conference, and he suddenly started talking about Seattle's safeties. I, I think that that's interesting. And you mentioned before that the you know the other podcasts, Richard Sherman, and you know, and there's been some buzz that maybe Seattle's going to kind of go back to what Pete Carroll has done in the past. If that is the case, then you need to have a safety who is a safety, not an outside linebacker. So again, this is an interesting conversation, I think, to be having a couple of days before the draft, because I think the Seahawks fans have an idea of it, but the national media has no clue that Seattle might be very, very interested in the safety class in 2023. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and other major podcast platforms to ensure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on our Wednesday show, we're going to be dishing out our final mocks. It's not our dual mock drafts where we couldn't pick the same players. We have the ability to pick the same players. It is who we think Seattle is going to take Thursday through Saturday. All the marbles put in the corner. We're putting all the chips on the table, and we're going to be grading and critiquing each other's drafts. Should be a really fun episode leading up to the start of the draft on Thursday. Hope you'll be joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Go Hawks.